so I'm, I'm going to further date myself with my intro to my sermon here. Um, and I'm going to ask you, how many of you remember a TV show called The Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous? Yeah, it was a great show. Every week, Robin Leach would take viewers on a personal tour of some of the most extravagant and extraordinary homes in the world. These homes were owned and occupied by some of the richest and most powerful people of the 80s and 90s. People like Pierce Brosnan, Michael Jordan, Morgan Fairchild, and Melissa Gilbert. Whenever I watched that show, I felt like I was being transported into places and scenes that I never would have access to in real life. It was like a beautiful, glittering dream. Well, I imagine that that's a bit what Ezekiel must have felt like in the chapters that we will be studying today, except that Ezekiel's was a dream that would eventually come true. I'm going to be summarizing a lot because we're covering three chapters this morning, uh, most of which involves a lot of measuring. So I didn't think you would mind the summary. Um, we will start out in chapter 40, if you have a Bible with you. If not, grab it from that pew in front of you, because we're going to be going in and out a lot this morning. As you'll remember, we have had 39 chapters of warnings and chastisement for Israel. God's ultimate goal was to restore Israel and his relationship with them. But first, they had to understand how far away they'd gotten from him, and they had to learn the roadmap back to him. As we'll see in chapter 40, Israel's discipline had met its intended goal, and they were finally ready for restoration. Now, the theologian Christopher Wright sums up these chapters this way. The point above all is not to be found in details themselves, but in the restoration of the dwelling place of God in the midst of his people. In other words, the goal was not to avoid suffering discipline, to get their discipline to end. Instead, the goal was to be with God, to know him and have relationship with him again. So keep that in mind as we dive in here. The point of God's discipline is always, always, always restoration and relationship. The details only point to and bolster that important truth. So Ezekiel this morning is going to be given a vision for the new temple that, was, that he was being instructed to build. The people were now ready to worship God again properly, and they needed a place to do it in. So we are going to be starting in verse 1 of chapter 40. In the 25th year of our exile, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th of the month, in the 14th year after the fall of the city, on that very day, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he took me there. In visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel, and he set me on a very high mountain, on whose south side were some buildings that looked like a city. He took me there, and I saw a man whose appearance was like bronze. He was standing in the gateway, with a linen cord and a measuring rod in his hands. The man said to me, Son of man, look carefully and listen closely and pay attention to everything that I am going to show you, for that is why I have brought you here. Tell the people of Israel everything that you see. So let's pause for a second and talk about Ezekiel's tour guide. This was no Robin Leach. Ezekiel described him as a man whose appearance was like bronze. Now, that was not a toss-away detail. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, when the apostle John is describing Jesus, he writes, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. So who was Ezekiel's tour guide on the new temple? It's very likely this was the pre-incarnate Christ. Why was that important? Because every single thing that he was describing to Ezekiel, every single detail of the temple was designed to point to him, to Jesus. 
everything about Old Testament worship was prescribed for a particular purpose, and that was to reflect, prophesy, and reveal Jesus, the ultimate sacrificial lamb who would offer Israel forgiveness and purification for their sins. Now, can you imagine being given a personal tour of the temple from Jesus himself? It must have been incredible. As they start their tour together, they begin at the place where they would eventually end their tour as well, the outer walls of the whole temple compound. Now, I say compound because there were multiple inner structures, all surrounded by a very large outer wall. The guesses of the total size vary, but suffice it to say, this compound was big. The purpose of the outer wall was largely symbolic, to separate and distinguish the common from the holy. It was to be a visual reminder to the Israelites that whenever they came in the temple, they were entering a place that was other, holy, set apart, a place of worship and communion and healing. The temple would reside on a very high mountain, as Ezekiel says in his vision. In truth, it wouldn't be a mountain so much as a hill, but the height is still significant. In the Old Testament, we read many times where the height of the temple is referenced. In Isaiah 2.2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established on the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Micah 4.2, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. You might remember a past sermon that I preached about the blind man who was told to wash in the pool of Siloam. In that sermon, I showed you where the pool was located in reference to the temple, as well as the steps that then ascended up to the temple and how massive they were. So here's a reminder. So these these are current um, pictures of temple stairs that they have found and recovered in Israel. So these are the stairs that ascended up. Can you bring on the second one? This was a picture, this is a guess at what uh, it must have looked like and the whole temple compound. You can see how high it is perched above the city. Bring up the third one. Here you get a closer picture. You see them going in. Look how high the temple walls are. And then you can see in the middle how they're going up those steps. The bottom, that small rectangular pool is the Pool of Siloam where they would wash and get clean, and then they would ascend up the temple stairs. You see those in the very middle, all the way up, and they still aren't even in the outer gates yet. So this is how massive this thing was. In the same way that the purpose of the wall and the gates was to remind God's people that they were entering someplace holy and set apart, The height of Ezekiel's temple was to remind God's people that God was above them, not literally but figuratively, and that the only way to reach him was by his gracious providence and provision. The temple was in a sense the opposite of Babel, where God's people were trying to reach him on their own to attain equality with him. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 reminds us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, declares declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The only way to God had to be provided by God himself. The temple was a forever reminder of God's condescending grace. God would forever be a singular God, who did not require his people to somehow attain to him, but who bent low to come down to them. God is equal measures, holy and gracious. Now, Ezekiel had the advantage of having an eagle-eye view of the temple. 
I have a few pictures here to help us visualize, as best we can guess, what he was seeing in his vision. So the first is a 3D rendering of what the whole compound must have looked like. Uh, you'll see the outer walls, and then inside you see the inner structures, the most prominent of which is the Holy of Holies in the very back. Bring up the second one. This is a closer look at the inside, and I apologize for um, the graphic. I wasn't able to get it to scan in our scanner, uh, but this is from a book called the Old Testament Handbook, which kind of lays out everything that they're seeing there. You can come up and ask me to see this afterwards if you want to. Um, but everything is numbered and laid out there, and you can see how orderly everything was. Everything was done precise and for a specific purpose. And then if you'll bring up, was there one more? Okay, that was it for this one. Okay, so on this image, I know it's hard to see, um, but you can see the main areas outlined throughout the rest of the chapter. So we start with the outer wall, which on that picture is number one. Uh, so that's on the very, very bottom left corner. And then throughout the chapter, as you read along, we're, again, we're not going to be reading verse by verse because it's so much, but as you read along, you'll see the rest of these pieces. So number two is the east gate to the outer court. So that is on the middle towards the bottom uh, past the outer wall. Number three is the outer court. So that is um, all those little vestibules that you'll see going around the whole thing. Number four is the north gate. That is on the right-hand side in the middle. Number five is the south gate, left-hand side in the middle. Uh, the inner court is the empty blue areas that you'll see in the middle of everything. Uh, the chambers for the priests are numbers 10 and 11. So going up from the bottom, it's those two outer chambers on the inside. So that's where the priests would get ready to do uh, their work. And then the number 13 is the vestibule of the temple. So that was where you went into the holy place and then the most holy place. Now the purpose of all of these areas was to prepare God's people for worship. So we are going to read again from Ezekiel 40, starting at verse 5. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, the firstborn of your herd and your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord, and you shall rejoice. You and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God had blessed you. Now, as, as I was reading this passage, it's, it's easy to get caught up in the details. It's easy to get caught up in the sacrifices and those things that were happening there. But I don't want you to miss that last verse. You shall eat there before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice. This, again, was a solemn place, a solemn place to confess your sins. But then, as Debbie said earlier, what happens after confession? Assurance of pardon, which brings us great joy. So this was a place that was in equal measure solemn and joyful, a place to meet with God, to lay out your burdens, and to be restored. So I don't want us to get lost in all the details and the measurements and the locations of everything. I want to remind us what the point is. God was again making a way for his people to draw near to him in worship. He was restoring the relationship that they had broken with him. They had run away, but he, the ever-patient, ever-loving father, had eagerly awaited their return. It reminds me of a story of another father and another child, one that Jesus would later tell. So we're going to take a minor detour here to Luke chapter 15. I think it's going to be a good framework for what God is doing here in Ezekiel. So we're going to be in chapter 15 of Luke. We'll start in verse 11. 
And he, being Jesus, said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that was coming to me. And he divided the property between them. Now, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had, and he took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered the property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything. And when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I am perishing here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran to him and embraced him. And he said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. You see any parallels here between Israel and this son? Israel had, like the younger brother, run away from their father God. They had pursued other gods and other things. You see, they had wanted all the benefits of a relationship with God without the responsibilities. In other words, they only wanted the material benefits of following God. But God was a loving father. He loved his child Israel too much to break relationship with her. Rather, he gave Israel what she wanted, and then he waited. God knows that anything and everything the world has to offer us are not even remotely comparable to being known and loved by him. He knows that the world will only leave us feeling like this son, empty, dirty, and destitute. And so he was building the temple, fresh and new, just like Israel's relationship with him. This was not something totally new, but something renewed by the grace and providential purpose of God. He was inviting Israel to return to him, to confess their need, and to receive his ample provision and grace once again. And so now we enter the inner temple in chapter 41. We're going to pick up our reading in verse 17. In the space above the outside of the entrance to the inner sanctuary and on the walls at regular intervals and all around the inner and outer sanctuary were carved cherubim and palm trees. Palm trees alternated with cherubim. Each cherub had two faces. The face of a human being toward the palm tree on one side and the face of a lion toward the palm tree on the other. They were, are, they were carved all around the whole temple. From the floor to the area above the entrance, cherubim and palm trees were carved on the wall of the main hall. The main hall had a rectangular door frame and the one at the front of the most holy place was similar. There was a wooden altar three cubits high and two cubits square. Its corners, its base, and its sides were all of wood. And the man said to me, This is the table that is before the Lord. Both the main hall and the most holy place had double doors. Each door had two leaves, two hinged leaves for each door. And on the doors of the main hall were carved cherubim and palm trees, like those carved on the walls. And there was a wooden overhang on the front of the portico. On the side walls of the portico were narrow windows with palm trees carved on each side. The side rooms of the temple also had overhangs. Okay, we're going to pause there because uh, I know that was a lot. 
Um, now, these, these, this was not a community of retirees that lived in Florida and just liked palm trees, okay? There was something else that was going on here. So Professor Mark Wilson explains the cherubim and the palm trees and the significance in this way. Throughout scripture, and especially in Ezekiel, the cherubim represent the awesome power of God, both his omniscience in being all-knowing and his omnipotence in having all power. The palm tree in the Middle East represents rest, water, and if a date palm, even food. The sight of palm trees indicates the presence of fruitfulness, water, and shade. But what intrigued me about this passage were the open flowers. Israel is famous for its wildflowers, thus the honey that flows in the land. But spring is short and heat gathers quickly. Psalm 103.15 uses the flowers to express the brevity of life. As for man, his days are like grass. He blooms like a flower of the field. When the wind passes over it, it vanishes and remembers its place no more. Now, as I age, again, these are the professor's words, not mine. As I age and spend more time reading my friend's obituaries, the swift passage of life is always present. There is a wintry melancholy as I contemplate all that is lost and all that is gone. Grandchildren sprout up. Things that you just painted need repainting. Memories fade, and so much is unfinished. And yet, in the presence of God, we are forever open flowers. In his presence, nothing that is truly good fades. God remembers every expression of love for him and for others. Nothing is forgotten, nothing lost. It is significant that here in God's presence, the flowers are open. Here it is safe to bloom. We can open ourselves to God. The Spirit's invitation to be an open flower before God is an invitation to enter into God's Sabbath rest and to walk with God in the cool of the day. What a beautiful picture. And I love that side by side, we have these seemingly contradictory images. The cherubim who represent God's awesomeness, his sovereignty, his all-seeing presence. And yet the worshiper is not called to shrink back in shame or fear. Rather, when he sees the other image, that of the open flower, he is invited to be vulnerable, to be honest, and genuine with God. When we see God as he truly is, we're invited to be our truest selves, no matter how messy or imperfect. This detail again reminds us that the temple is all about worship. Every detail not only invokes, but invites worship. Okay, let's continue on to our last chapter, chapter 42. We're going to be reading verses 13 and 14 about the temple's chambers. And then he said to me, the north and south rooms facing the temple courtyard are the priest's rooms, where the priests who approach the Lord will eat the most holy offerings. There they will put the most holy offerings, the grain offerings, the sin offerings, and the guilt offerings, for this place is holy. Once the priests enter the holy precincts, they are not to go in the inner court, or sorry, in the outer court until they leave behind the garments in which they minister, for these are holy. They are to put on other clothes before they go near the places that are for the people. Now, special clothes for the priests may sound a little silly to us. After all, on any given Sunday, the fanciest thing that you will see Pastor Mike or I wearing are our clerical robes. But the garments that the priests wore were much more intricate and special. So the AV team is going to put up a picture for us. So these are the garments that the priests would have worn. Here is how Lindsay Jacoby explains these garments. Now, why did it even matter what the priests wore? After all, God doesn't care what package we wrap ourselves in. He sees the heart, not the outer trappings. But here, God's holy and set-apart people were represented 
with these holy set-apart garments. Every piece of the priest's garments had a specific purpose. So the ephod, which you will see, um, I think it's in the center of the front. Um, yeah, so it's the second word up uh, from the bottom on the right-hand side. Uh, so that piece, the ephod, um, was made to carry the names of the tribes of Israel before the Lord. The breast piece, which is in the very center, was designed to help the priest make decisions as he carried the 12 tribes symbolically over his heart. The row would be lined with bells. You can see that on the very bottom border. So the priest could be heard at all times and retrieved if he died in the Lord's presence. The turban, which was worn on the head, was to represent an offering, and it said, holy to the Lord. It was representing an offering for the sins of all of Israel. Every thread and every stitch was designed for a reason, for glory and for beauty. What a beautiful example of what it means to bring God our very best. Not because he needs it, not because he wants to see us all dressed up, it's because the priest putting on these garments was a physical act of ascribing to the Lord the glory due his name. Theirs was a high and holy calling, and everything from their head down to their toes was supposed to reflect that. The splendor of these garments was not to glorify the priests. It was to point to God's glory and God's beauty. So what is the takeaway for us? In 2024, in the U.S., seated comfortably in a Protestant church, we don't have a temple. We're able to freely worship God in his house every Sunday. And in fact, we're able to worship him anywhere and anytime we choose. Here's the connection piece I don't want you to miss. Because of the incarnate Christ and his abiding Holy Spirit, we have full and free access to God. God has drawn near to us in Christ, so much so that he now lives inside of us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? We, you and I, every believer in this room, are the new temple. Isn't that crazy to think about? When we read here how carefully constructed every single detail of the temple was, how utterly sacred, how other it was, and then we think about the fact that we are just ordinary, sin-prone people, and we are now the temple of God, it's almost inconceivable, except that all of history has always been pointing to this beautiful new reality. God brought his presence down to earth temporarily through temple worship. God brought his image down to earth through Jesus' incarnation. He brought his spirit down to earth permanently at Jesus' ascension. And Jesus will bring heaven itself down to earth permanently at his second coming. When Jesus returns at the end of the age, we're told that he will set all things right. He will judge evil. And heaven and earth will be permanently and irrevocably joined together. We will have no temple. There will be no altar, no gates, no walls, no special clothing, no ornamentation. Jesus himself will be the new temple, and his eternal and abiding presence is promised to all who belong to him. Jesus Emmanuel, God with us, literally, forever and ever. Doesn't that give you a little chill bumps to think about? 
The houses I saw and the lifestyles of the rich and famous, they can't even begin to compare to what that day will be like, to the glory that we will forever behold and live among. It's nothing that our money can buy. It's nothing that any human hands can ever build. But it's the promised inheritance of the children of God. The ones who realize that the things of earth are just pig slop. The ones who remember their father's character and who run back to him over and over again, trusting his kindness, humble, repentant, grateful. I want to close this out with some words from Psalm 103. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father who has compassion on his children, so the Lord will have compassion on those who fear him. Amen and amen. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, how we look forward to that day when we will forever get to live in your presence with sin out of the way. Oh, what we can't even imagine what it will be like. But we just pray more and more that you would increase your presence, increase our awareness of who you are, our understanding of who you are, that we would get those little foretastes now of what that day would be like. And we pray, Jesus, that you would help us to to spread far and wide the good gospel message that there is a loving Father who is awaiting his children's return. All we have to do is come back. Lord Jesus, may we invite others to come back to you, to know your goodness, your healing, your restoration, your forgiveness and your glory. Lord, help us to do that by the power of your Holy Spirit and in your holy, precious name. Amen. All right. Friends, as you go out this week, I pray that your heart would be an open flower to the Lord. Open because he's safe, open because he's good, and open to share his goodness with all those you come in contact with. So may you go out in his power to share his good news. Amen and amen.